An invisible virus attacks a city. Thousands are infected and many die. Sound familiar? It happened in Memphis in 1878 when we lived through the Yellow Death. Live music is in short supply right now, so tonight we offer up two performances from the musicians of Creative Aging. Funding for the best times is provided by the Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. 142 years ago, the city of Memphis was nearly destroyed by an invisible virus. The yellow fever epidemic of 1878 altered the course of the city's history. At the time, no one knew the cause of the disease. There was no cure and no vaccine. The death toll from the fever was greater than the total number of victims of the attacks of 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. And today, history seems to be repeating itself because 142 years later, the city is faced with another invisible enemy, the coronavirus. Let's travel back in history to Memphis in the 1870s, when the city was stalked by the Yellow Death. In the 1870s, Memphis was a boom town. Because there had been no land battle here during the Civil War, there was no widespread destruction. Business and commerce had continued throughout the war, and by 1870, Memphis's population had swelled to over 40,000, almost double the size of Nashville or Atlanta, and challenging New Orleans for the title of the largest city in the South. Memphis was no stranger to yellow fever. The disease struck the city in 1855 and 1867, resulting in around 400 deaths. In 1873, the fever struck again, much harder this time, and left 2,000 people dead. In mid-June of 1878, word came upriver confirming that yellow fever was in New Orleans. Dr. Robert Wood Mitchell of the Memphis Board of Health called for a quarantine, but the city was split between pro-quarantine and anti-quarantine factions, and it delayed any action until it was too late. On August 13th, the Board of Health announced the first yellow fever death in Memphis. Yellow fever is a gruesome viral disease attacking the liver and kidneys. High fever can lead to hallucinations. The skin will often turn yellow from jaundice. Victims can hemorrhage internally and bleed from every orifice in their body. 19th century medical science had no clue as to the cause or cure for yellow fever no vaccine existed. Fear gripped the city, and within a span of five days, over half of the city's population packed up and left. Among them were some of the city's best and brightest citizens. Many would never return. The city's remaining population of some 19,000 people were witness to a daily roll call of the dead printed in the newspaper. By September, the disease was averaging 200 deaths per day, and coffins were stacked on the street awaiting burial. There were heroes amidst the horror. Dr. William J. Armstrong was one of several physicians who stayed in Memphis and was joined by volunteer doctors from as far away as New York. Annie Cook ran a brothel on Gayoso Street. She turned her house into a makeshift hospital where she and her girls cared for the sick as best they could. Both Annie Cook and Dr. Armstrong died of yellow fever. As the death toll mounted, Memphians awaited the first killing frost of the winter. Finally, on the night of October 18th, the frost arrived and put an end to the epidemic. Of the 19,000 people who had stayed in Memphis, 
an estimated 17,000 contracted yellow fever and 5,150 died. In 2006, local author and historian Molly Caldwell Crosby wrote The American Plague, tracing the story of a disease that shaped our history. Molly, thanks for being on The Best Times. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks let's, for having me. You're welcome. Uh, to begin with, tell me what life was like in Memphis before the fever struck. Um, Memphis was a town that was really booming and thriving. Um, it had done, it had come out of the Civil War, war in very good shape, but um, it had also just established itself as a hub, um, both with the railroads and then being on the river with steamboats. And so um, it was sort of, I've thought of it as sort of a gateway, as leaving the sort of civilized South um, and moving towards the frontier West. Uh, so it, it brought a lot of diversity um, and a lot of business to Memphis. And um, one of the other things that kind of surprised me in my research was it had a, just a beautiful skyline downtown and a lot of architecture that had been designed by the same architect who designed the mall in Washington, D.C. So um, it, it was a beautiful skyline and it was really an impressive city. At the same time, it was a pretty dirty place to live, too, wasn't it? Yes, most American cities were pretty filthy at that point, um, and Memphis was no exception. <laughs> now, the, uh, the citizens uh, heard of yellow fever in June in New Orleans, so they knew it was downriver from them. Why didn't they enact a quarantine, or why didn't we take some sort of measure to protect the city? Um, our Board of Health had actually contacted New Orleans in May um, and said, could you let us know um, the deport the Department of Health for Louisiana if you have any outbreaks in New Orleans, because this was a pretty yearly occurrence in the Caribbean and South America. So everyone in the U.S. knew to be on the lookout in Fort Towns. Um, and New Orleans said, of course, we'll let you know, and they did not. So they, they first got their case, um, the first case we believe that landed there uh, was probably about mid-May. And they never contacted Memphis. Um, Memphis really only found out about it through gossip. Um, you know, they, they read about it in the newspaper in July that there was an outbreak uh, in New Orleans. So for all of those weeks in between, really, um, they were sending boats and trains continuing up to Memphis. Um, and Memphis itself was also arguing for whether or not to quarantine. Um, quarantines in cities where, you know, you rely, local economy relies so heavily on um, being a hub on shipping. I mean, that is their, their lifeline. So quarantining a place for three months is, is really going to be devastating to any local economy. Um, so New Orleans resisted telling people because they didn't want to be quarantined. Memphis resisted quarantining because they were afraid of what it would do to their business. Um, and that allowed the disease to get in, really. What, what, what was the reaction of other cities and towns nearby Memphis? Did they institute quarantines? Um, they did once they knew that there was an outbreak in Memphis, um, and there was sort of a panic within just about five days. People fled Memphis. Um, they said people left doors open and tables still set with silver and just, you know, took wagons, trains, boats, anything they could. Um, about 50% of the population fled in just a matter of days. So all of these people start pouring out into the countryside, and a lot of the other small towns did what they called shotgun quarantines, where they stood on the train tracks or stood on bridges with shotguns and just would not allow um, Memphians in. They would bring water down to the train cars sometimes and let them pass on, but um, we ended up having a lot of refugee camps out in the countryside to help take the influx um, of, of all the people that were, you know, evacuating the city, basically. Now, as you pointed out, about half the population just packed up and left. Uh, were, they, were they leaving out of sheer fear and terror, or did they somehow know that they could outrun the fever? Uh, probably a little bit of both. I think um, everyone feared being stuck in the city when it actually is locked down, um, because as it proved to be the case in Memphis, um, once the city itself was quarantined, you know, there's no, they didn't really have grocery stores open. They didn't have access to money, medicines. Um, you know, they could go to the bank, I think, one hour a day. People would try to send in supplies from other cities, but they were very much cut off from the rest of the United States and the vast majority of people in Memphis ended up getting yellow fever. So a lot of people that could afford to leave did. They got out, they went to visit relatives, um, you know, fled to country homes to do whatever they could, hoping to 
get out of here before the quarantine and before they were infected. And they did not know how yellow fever was spread at that point. Uh, sounded, sounds like it was much like the lockdown that many cities have had during this coronavirus pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, there were 5,000 people, a little over 5,000 people, who died from yellow fever, and that happened during approximately a, a two-month period. What was life like in Memphis during the fever epidemic? Well, after they had about half of the population fled, um, they, there were about 19,000 people who were left behind in Memphis or chose to stay to help. Um, 17,000 of them ended up getting yellow fever in that two-month span. So, and then, as you mentioned, over 5,000 died. Um, so it was really, truly overwhelming for everyone in the city. Um, the descriptions that I write about in my book are just, you know, the, um, that you could smell death outside of the city for miles. Um, they had wagons come up and down the streets every day and yell, bring out your dead. But even then, there weren't enough grave diggers. So soon, bodies or coffins started piling up um, on the street corners. Uh, every night, people were burning the belongings or the homes of you know, people who had had, who had been infected with yellow fever, trying to, they didn't know how it was spread. They were trying to sort of um, get rid of the germs that they thought might be spreading it. Um, so it was just really a terrifying atmosphere, I think. And um, some of, one of the more disturbing, but also touching stories that I wrote about was these nuns that would have to go door to door downtown looking for um, orphan children, because so often the parents would die of yellow fever and the children would be left at home alone for days. Um, so they were all brought into this orphanage by the nuns. Yeah, you pointed out, as, as in, in our current pandemic, of course, there are heroes. And uh, yeah. we celebrate our healthcare workers. We celebrate uh, those in essential businesses. So there were certainly heroes during the yellow fever epidemic as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was really one of the most inspiring things about writing this story to me, uh, was just really getting that story out of these heroes, of these people, because it was the doctors and the nurses and the priests and the nuns, they chose to stay behind in Memphis, and most of them did die. Um, today, they're known as the Martyrs of Memphis, and there's, we have some monuments to them in a park downtown, um, but they really and truly just stay here, stayed here knowing that they would most likely die, and they just tried to treat as many patients as they could before they died. Um, even one of the doctors I write about, William Armstrong, was still trying to rise from his bed when he was feverish to go treat more patients, even as he was dying of yellow fever. So um, they just, they are true, true heroes and martyrs um, to this epidemic. And of course, the sad thing is that medical science had no clue then uh, to the right. source of the disease. They certainly uh, had no vaccine and no cure, really. They really didn't have any medicine uh, that could help, correct? Correct. They, it would be another, um, it wouldn't be actually till about 1900, um, another 20 years, 22 years until they realized it was being spread by an insect, by mosquitoes. So, um, you know, in 1878, it would just, these outbreaks would arrive in cities. And I think that was probably some of the terror. They really didn't know. They knew it came with warm weather, but they didn't know why. The idea that an insect could be spreading it was still sort of a new idea. This was more the height of the germ, um, germ theory of disease. So that's really where most medical minds were. Um, so the other part of my book really kind of goes into the work that Dr. Walter Reed and his um, human volunteers did to demonstrate that it's actually a mosquito that spreads yellow fever. Um, once they did establish that, they were really able to help um, just taking personal responsibility, being able to um, wear protective clothing, keep doors closed, windows closed, um, and do as much as they could until a vaccine came out in the 1930s. Now, you mentioned in the book, out of the 19,000 or so people remaining, about 17,000 contracted the fever, the vast majority, yeah. but the vast majority also survived that fee- fever. So mm-hmm. many lived, some died. Why? Um, even today, it's um, a little bit like with um, COVID, you see some cases that are much more severe, and they don't really know why. Um, so in this particular epidemic of yellow fever, it did seem to be more virulent than past epidemics had been. More people were contracting it. More people were dying from it. Um, I think uh, in Memphis, they had probably over 30% of the people who contracted it died. And some of that may be due simply to neglect, because when you overwhelm the system that way, um, there is no one there to bring you water, food, help, you know, help in the recovery, anything like that. So, um, so some of that could have just been 
simply been by overwhelming the system. But, um, but they also just felt, the doctors did, that this was um, an unusually virulent and um, deadly um, outbreak that they had seen, you know, in their years of experience. Now, you mentioned at the beginning that Memphis was a boom town in, in the 1870s. So what happened to Memphis after the fever? After the fever, um, a lot of the people did not return. The, a lot of the businesses moved on. Um, there was a second epidemic the following year because we had a really warm winter and a lot of the mosquito eggs just wintered over. Um, so they hit with another yellow fever outbreak, not as devastating, but it was enough to keep a lot of people just give up on the city. Um, so a lot of the businesses, a lot of the money left the city and the people that were left behind really, a lot of them could not afford to pay taxes. Um, so eventually our city leaders voted away the city's charter um, and they, it would remain um, out of the city's control for the next 14 years. And, you know, there were even calls in the state to maybe burn Memphis to the ground and just start over. <laughs> but um, to me, that's also one of the impressive parts of the story is that they were able to rebuild um, the city, that there were enough determined people to stay here, and some good did come out of it. We ended up having one of the first um, and most successful clean water and sewage systems in the world that helped clean up downtown and ended up being used in other cities elsewhere. Um, I think some of our, our medical history and our medical success in the city today stems from that epidemic as well, so um, some good did come out of it for sure. Do you see parallels between our current coronavirus pandemic and the yellow fever epidemic? Um, I, I do. I see uh, in, in particular, I mean, of, of course, outbreaks of yellow fever are very localized and they can be very quarantined. Um, because it's being spread by a mosquito, it's really staying put. It's not, it's not moving a whole lot with people as COVID is. Um, but I think, you know, when I set out to write the yellow fever book, my intention was sort of to show people today what it really used to be like to live through these epidemics because it was so foreign to us. Um, it was hard to imagine. And now it's, you know, kind of with bitter irony, I'm re realizing that uh, we're living through it now and seeing the parallels and seeing the lockdowns and quarantines. Um, but I think in a case like this, where you're talking about a contagious disease uh, and it's on a global scale, it really makes, everyone in the world, um, your neighbor, and it makes every other country your community. And if you're going to stop the spread of it, it takes, you know, the government being accountable for it. And it takes people being accountable, whether it's, you know, you dump out the water in your yard, you don't collect mosquitoes, or you wear masks when you go to the grocery store. Um, it just takes across the community uh, an effort altogether, um, unfortunately, you know, to, to really stop the spread of something like COVID. Uh, so I hope we'll see in the coming months if we're able to do more of that. And of course, the vaccine. That's ultimately the goal. <laughs> well, I, I hope we learn those lessons well uh, as we move into the future, because obviously it's happened in the past. It's happened now in the present. It certainly can happen in the future. So Molly, thank Certainly's you so much yeah. for being on the best times and talking about the yellow fever epidemic of 1878. Oh, thank you for having me. Music enhances our lives at any age. That is the mission statement of Creative Aging, a nonprofit organization that brings the arts to the area's senior population, particularly those in assisted living centers and nursing homes. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has locked down these facilities and silenced the music temporarily. Tonight, we close out our show with two songs from two of Creative Aging's performers, The Side Street Steppers and David Bowen. Enjoy the music. This is a little, uh, this is a little number entitled, Oh, Mr. Bill Bailey, won't you please come up? Here we go.
Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.